Uh, welcome to the 10th episode of Futurecast, where we talk about how to build the future from Iceland. I have a longtime friend and a recovering politician, Helgi Raff, who has been a good friend of mine for a long time. Uh, so we're going to talk about lots of things, uh, yep. starting with uh, your background, where did we meet, and then uh, how your uh, last chapter was, and, uh, and, and, and your new uh, interests and passions where we at least aligned on talking about space and technologies around that. Uh, so Helki, welcome. Thank you. Um, so let's start at the beginning. You are listening to the Futurecast. I remember, uh, I think our first encounter was when we met in uh, Garda Strate, where uh, yeah. you were you were a programmer, back-end yes. programmer for Green Cloud, and I was uh, just coming in as a CEO. Yeah, and uh, that was a that was a monthly crew time in Iceland. It was 2013. Uh, 2012. 2012. Yeah, 2012. Wow. Um, so tell me, tell me about uh, you know how how did uh, your career start? What made you uh, switch over? So um, I was in 2012. I was just back from Canada, having lived there for two and a half years. Uh, started working at Green Cloud, where we met, and then I heard about this party being formed called the Pirate Party, which is well at the time at least was essentially a bunch of computer geeks, as yeah. far as I could tell. Yeah. So I joined, being a computer geek, and uh, ran for office and got into parliament. You know, afterwards thinking, well, I guess that really happened. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's, so got in parliament in 2013. Um, it was a snap election in 2016, in which I did not run. Um, so I got a year as a private citizen. And then in 2017, they had another snap election in which I did run. And so I'm now just out of that, like mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that I should refer to your uh, career in politics as a recovering politician. Uh, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, and I always tell everybody that uh, uh, I'm way below the pay grade to talk about politics. So I will just <laughs> stop. And, and just, just maybe for you from a personal learning point of view, you know, right. what, what are the things you've learned? What are the things that you will take away from this experience? Uh, from politics? From politics, yeah. So, okay. Um, being a member of parliament is obviously a privilege. But in my opinion, the greatest privilege is actually how much you learn about things that you otherwise would not, because mm -hmm. it's about governing the entire country and nothing is irrelevant from it. Mm -hmm. Everything somehow matters in, in parliament, things that you did not necessarily even know that existed, mm -hmm. let alone had any kind of professional um, incentive to, to study it and get involved with it. And in retrospect, actually, because in 2013 to 16, uh, there was only three of us in, in, in the Pirate Party in Parliament, mm -hmm. which is way too few to have a, a well, like, like, mm -hmm. to, to cover everything. Like, like yeah. literally, it's mathematically impossible to show up to every me committee meeting, because there are eight committees and only three people, uh, with only 24 hours in the, in in the a day. day. Yeah. But the flip side of that is that you have to involve yourself with everything. You can't really specialize in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So you have to like be in the committee on foreign affairs every once in a while, in the committee on agriculture and education and everything. So I mean, it's 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 a high stress environment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like you never have time, basically. I mean, right. rather in, whether in private life or or in political life. But the flip side, again, is like you have to sort of push yourself into learning sure. all sorts of things. It's kind so. of like uh, drinking from the fire hose to be <laughs> yeah, relevant. Yes. Yes, you know, a, uh, a, maybe <laughs> sitting in the parliamentary committee on agriculture right. and uh, you're a computer geek. Yeah. So you got to do the read up yeah, before yeah, yeah. the committee meetings. You know, maybe yes. walk us through a couple of those learnings. Yeah, actually, yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting point because being a computer geek and a prog programmer in particular, um, it's... it's um, it's an underestimated skill because you can use it outside of just as a, mm -hmm. as, a, as a profession. And in politics, as a matter of fact, I use programming and my technical skills in order to sort of organize data, cover things, and, and keep track of things that I imagine other MPs with uh, limited technical skills would not be able to do. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that was, that was fun. Also, I made sure because I knew that, okay, I'm going to be away from the technical industry for four years. Mm -hmm. I better keep up because right. four years is an eternity, eternity. Yes. In, in IT. So uh, I made sure to, to keep up my technical skills and used it for my political work mm -hmm. um, to do that. Very cool. So now that uh, you know, elections are over and that chapter is... Uh is kind of closed, and you're yes. opening new chapters. Mm -hmm. You know, give us some uh, window view into this. Well, what's uh, what's in store for Helgi in the next uh, five, ten years? What that's are you a, planning that, to do? That's a great question because I don't know. I'm at a crossroads right now, <laughs> okay. so like you know, it's uh, it's exciting. I, a lot of people feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. in this situation, but I absolutely love it, and so I'm enjoying it to the max. Right. Not knowing what I'm going to be. I mean, doing there's, exactly there's no better time. time to be a computer geek uh, than that's right. now. That's right. I mean, it's it's so exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many different fields in which you can use that skill. Right. Like, there's virtually not a field where you cannot. You know, right. even even the old industries and professions mm -hmm. actually benefit from that skill because Absolutely. you get to modernize them. It's one of the funnest thing you can do is mm -hmm. to actually take something that is boring and dry mm -hmm. and make it colorful and fun. Yeah. You know? And yeah, so. you've just, you've just uh, outlined my investment thesis. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I basically just invest in those kinds of things. Yeah. Pretty much I see what's being designed and done yeah. 100 years back and say, okay, what would happen if we do it all over again and start from scratch? Yeah. What, and um, you would be amazed how much you can get done starting that way. Mm -hmm. Because um, I've seen that there's this, um, there's so much baggage we bring into clear thinking. Mm -hmm it kind of colors everything you do. But when yes. you get a white piece of paper, I mean, it's just so refreshing to, yeah. to start drawing that up. Yeah, and nowhere do you see this as clearly as in politics, in my opinion. Because we have to remember, I mean, it's easy to be sort of cynical towards politics mm -hmm. and, and parliamentary work. The thing is, um, the parliamentary system, democracy, is a peace treaty. It's right. what we do instead of fighting each other, right? right. So it's, it's a conflict zone. It, this is where we, go to have our conflicts. The result of that nature is that it's a conservative institution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like to change very much because everyone who have radically different fu fundamental beliefs in, in life and society, right, right, right. they have to agree on a change for it to actually yeah. emerge. Not only that, uh, whatever change that happens within a small group of people will impact everybody. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Right? So, so the, the weight of those decisions do matter. Yeah. And um, I, I, for once, have always believed that you know policy really drives a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I live in the other spectrum, uh, which is uh, you know startups and things like that, because lots of things there, there are no rules. Because when you start, there are no rules. Yeah, you don't know what you. You don't know what you're building. Yeah. You don't know whether it's going to work. You don't know if anybody's going to want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, and then you kind of figure it out mm -hmm. as you build it, and but you can't do that. In the, in the policy framework? Not really. You can, you can try, and you can try to sort of seed the ideas into this conservative model, but it's going to take time. So if you're yeah. going into politics, you better be patient. Yeah. And so so the, the word disruptive doesn't, doesn't <laughs> resonate within, the, within those four walls. Even the, kind of dis even the disruption is still like manifests itself in, in conservative ways. You know. Sure. No I mean, I, I think, uh, I, think um, I think generationally we are thankful for that because democracy is something that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Know, there, there, are, there are lots of people who don't have that privilege. Absolutely. And, and I am for once, uh, you know, again, I, I come from one of the largest democracies in the world, India. And the then largest I become democracy, a, yeah. and, then, and then I've become a citizen of Iceland, which is also a representative democracy, which is uh, pretty amazing. And I participated in the election uh, as a citizen for the first time this, this year. So it was a uh, very privilege uh, to go and vote, and I did that. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, you know, the cross-section <clears throat> that we started uh, riffing about, right. space. Yeah. And uh, technologies related to space. Tell me, you know, what what got you there, and and, and of course, computer geeks and nerds, and oh, by the way, my tribe. So, right. so not in any uh, any way to, uh, taking a stab at it, but it seems natural to right. think about these things. Right. Yes, absolutely. I mean, like, um, so where to begin? 
So I was in Parliament. Uh, I think this was in 2015, it must have been. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I can't even remember exactly what was the catalyst exactly, but I'm, I had known for a few years that if an Icelandic citizen, well, an Icelander, wanted to become a an astronaut, the first thing that they had to do was become a citizen of a different country <laughs> because we're not a part of any kind of space operations in which astronauts are being hired. That's insane. It's insane. It's absolutely <laughs> patently insane. And um, a lot of people have this thought, like, that's, that's crazy. It's so sad, you know? You know, yeah. we, we, can, we can do whatever we want, right? You know, it's... Uh, no, you can't be an astronaut. But you can't be an astronaut, <laughs> you know? So, like, um, that thought had been with me for a few years, and I thought that was so somehow, yeah, sad, unfortunate. But um, I had this idea, uh, again, I, I can't remember the catalyst, to suggest to Parliament by motion that we would join the European Space Agency. And I thought to myself, okay, I'll, I'll have to find a policy foundation. Lo and behold, found out at that time there's actually a policy in the Pirate Party to join the European Space Agency, um, which was very convenient. So mm -hmm. I, I uh, put forth that motion, and to be perfectly honest, at the time I thought to myself, you know, this will encourage the dialogue. People mm -hmm. will start talking about this and examining like the financial aspects and, mm -hmm. and such. You know, it was just uh, to get the conversation going. But as in politics, often um, predictions fail, luckily this time, and it actually got passed. So now it is official policy of Iceland to apply for membership of the European Space Agency. Now that was in 2016, I believe. Mm -hmm. So a few years have passed and uh, we're not, it's not going as fast as I would like, but it is a long-term process. It right. takes a while. I mean, 10 years is a very short time actually to, mm -hmm. to become a full member. Mm -hmm. And also what I found in politics, uh, as with Icelanders in general, is that they assume that we don't have a role to play in space mm -hmm. because it's a small country. And we're right. sort of, we're sort of spoon-fed this notion that we're too small to matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, no matter how much we prove time and time again, in a modern international world, this is simply not the case. Right. We are a part of the United Nations. We are a part of all sorts of international institutions, um, the European Economic Area being one of them. Mm -hmm. and it's a perfectly, perfectly viable option for us to, to become part of the European Union. And it's a perfectly viable option for us to become a part of the European Space Agency. There's, it's not an exception. It's just that space is presented to us as the United States of America fighting the Soviet Union in 1969 right. through bragging rights. Right. Right? That was the competitional model of the day, you know, who gets, who gets the brag about it. Still, still we, we talk about something that was um, in, I don't know, headline conversation 40 years back. Yeah. We think that's uh, the recent history. Absolutely. And so uh, not only is that changing, and, and uh, we can go more into that, but also, you know, the European Space Agency is a conglomerate of nations that otherwise could not, on their own accord, hold a space program like NASA. Right. right? That's the whole point. It's, it's, it's a cooperative movement, if you will. It does include small nations, and that's, that is its exact purpose. Mm -hmm. Like Luxembourg, which is actually relatively big in space, you know, mm -hmm. education and whatnot, you know, that's like 600 and some thousand people. It's mm -hmm. not a lot bigger than us. I mean, no. Sure, double the size, but a double of a very small size. Right. You know. I mean, the, the, I, I find the argument about the population a metric yeah. in something like this. Right. Kind of, you know, makes no sense to me. Right. I'm like, why should it matter? And by the way, the whole Silicon Valley enterprise, it's about 350,000 people. Right. And also, I mean, think to yourself, if you are a citizen of Germany and you live in a city of 200,000 people, does it occur to you that you can't participate in space? No, of course not. No. The, the, the population doesn't matter. What matters is what kind of cooperative framework right. you have. And, and the European and, Space and, Agency is And then, of course, that you know, there is precedence for why those things have transpired, because yeah. it used to be that space programs were national initiatives. Yes. These were uh, obviously very resource heavy. Uh, lots of um, people have to be involved. Um, not anymore. I mean, if, if a private enterprise could do it, yeah. and, and by the way, not one, a couple of them have done it. And uh, my, yeah, I talk about this to most of the founders, uh, and, and I remember the conversation in the early days of startups and all that in Iceland. 
the mindset, the yeah. mentality to say that, hey, we're too small. And I said, every startup everywhere in the world is small. It doesn't <laughs> matter where you are, right. Right? right? What matters is what problems you're working on and do you have ways to cross those you know, thresholds. Yes. And, and um, in the context of Iceland, uh, I mean, we had a previous conversation with Are, who used to work for NASA, the rector of uh, uh, Reykjavik University, and we, we touched upon this last week when we were talking about this, and, and he was like, I agree with you. When I came here in 2007, a lot of people were throwing these things at me, and I thought that they didn't make any sense. And I said, Agreed. <laughs> so, you know, at least it, take, it took us only 10 years to come to a point where, as a nation, we all agree that size really doesn't matter in a lot of these big ideas. Right. What really matters is finding out what role we can play and actually doing that well and doing that effectively so we can, I don't know, to be cliche about it, move the human race forward. Absolutely. And that's ultimately what's Space is about, in my personal opinion, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, the political stance is that it's about industry, it's about industry, it's about industry, then education and science and all that good stuff that has to do with industry. But more fundamentally, and perhaps personally, it's about us as a species getting off of this planet and colonizing the stars, you know, right. and, and that's not a radical idea no, anymore. It's no. just not, you know. Not. It sounds dreamy, but it's not. It's just, not. It's, it's, it's no. not. And, we, and ha we have to, if we're not gonna do it, who's gonna do it? The turtles exactly. are not gonna do it. No, we nobody, nobody, this. and, and, and <laughs> this also comes back to this whole uh, future cast uh, idea. The idea is to kind of inspire these kind of ideas to ask the question, why shouldn't we do them? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure in some cases, there are perfectly reasonable reasons why we shouldn't do it, but I've been racking my brain to ask myself, why shouldn't Iceland do any of these things? And I can't find one reasonable answer. There is no reasonable answer. Uh, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, the population, so like, I mean, back to the European Space Agency, the whole, the whole framework is that um, nations who participate, they mostly choose what kind of projects they take in. So we get to select our strengths. Mm -hmm. And we do have a number of strengths uh, in various scientific fields, meteorology Absolutely. being obvious, you know, and, and, and all of the science that has to do with the volcano that is Iceland. Geology. Geology, I mean, yeah, I mean, no brainer, right? Yeah. Um, and people often maybe don't know that Space, the space industry is largely about the Earth. It's almost exclusively about the Earth, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, ga gathering data, keeping up with data, utilizing that data and all that good stuff. It's not just, you know, filling a rocket with money and shooting it into the sun. Sure. It's about finding smart and innovative ways to improve life on Earth. Mm -hmm. That is the point. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. Uh, we have a very strong software industry, as, a, as mm -hmm. one example, and I mean, we have lots of great scientists. No one would think to themselves that Iceland is too small to be big in mathematics, per capita, of course. Right. Uh, why would we be too small for space? Why would we be too small to be a member of the United Nations no. or the European no. Economic Area? I, I think uh, this is where you can very um, vehemently say size doesn't matter at, at all. all. Right. Uh, what matters is, um, how ambitious you are about what you can contribute and what you bring to the table in terms of uh, contribution cognitively. Yep. And again, I think Iceland has a lot to contribute in this space. And that's the whole reason why we're doing this hackathon, uh, the space hackathon in November, uh, in partnership with the European Union, where the Copernicus and the Galileo star system data is going to be made available. So, you know, we can get a bunch of hackers together and say, okay, let's build something. Yeah. And not just build something because we can build something, but let's build something that will protect the Arctic because that is also, um, I've, I've, I've found that, you know, ideas for ideas sakes don't really work if you don't kind of nail it with context. Right. And, you know, Iceland is part of the Arctic. We get the Arctic Circle idea. Mm -hmm. we, we are part of the, the ecosystem for, the, for probably the first time in our life. We are exploring new frontiers. You know, this is new frontier. Yeah. But we don't have to kind of go through the same challenges about figuring this out without technology, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, the other thing that I think about is, you know, space from anywhere in the world looks the same. 
Right. <laughs> really, really, right? <laughs> it doesn't less, yeah. matter where you are, you know. You could right. be in LA, you could be in Reykjavik, but yeah. end of the day, space is the same. And um, so this hackathon is going to be about protecting the Arctic in terms of, you know, how do we navigate the seas now that the ice caps are melting? Yeah. Um, how do we protect life on land? How do we protect the life in the sea yep. using this data? You know, yes. and, and, and it gives a lot of insight. Yeah, and Can what you, I find fascinating is like, um, you know, how is the environment going to change as yeah. a result of ever increasing, ever increasing climate change? Mm -hmm. You know, just the oceans, the weather, the temperature, the moisture, whatever, what have you. Like all of this um, is changing very fast in the Arctic, presumably, and so like um, we have to we have to stay on top of that. Right. Um, now more than ever, of course, and of, I mean. Speaking of climate change, um, like we don't stand a snowball's chance in hell without space data, without yeah. uh, as much data as we can get. Yeah. And furthermore, we need to explore ideas that maybe is not obvious at this point what exactly they're going to be, which is what brings us to the most recent phenomenon in the space sector, which is extraordinarily exciting. I mean, everybody knows about SpaceX, right? Because sure. they make headlines all the time. Sure. And a few more know about Virgin Galactic. They, they make headlines because they basically did what NASA was trying to do for 50 years. Yes. And they did it in five years. Yes, and they did it as a private enterprise. Right. And that's key. But what people don't see in the headlines are all the small businesses that are now in the space sector. Mm -hmm. um, there is now a sort of revolution, I guess you can call it, uh, sometimes dubbed Space 4.0 or New Space, mm -hmm. depending on who you're speaking with, um, which means that private enterprises are basically slowly but surely taking over the roles of national institutions in, in space. Mm -hmm. um, this is happening now. And now the question for Iceland is, are we going to be a part of this or not? Right. Are we going to be late into this game or are we going to be mm -hmm. early into this game? Mm -hmm. And I move that we should be early in this game because we have no reason not to. No. Um, and what's happening there is that, so, okay, so uh, say in the 60s or 50s and 60s, when the Soviet Union and the United States were basically fighting over bragging rights, mm -hmm. that was the competitional model. Mm -hmm. That's why we're going to space. Why? So to, to show the Soviets that we're better than them, right? Um, and I mean, that got us to the moon. Kudos, mm -hmm. it's cool, love yeah. it. But it's limited in right. that it's, 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 um, its sole incentive really is to sort of compete with one other giant in the, the participant. Right. Now, not only do we have more nation states um, involved in space, but we also have private enterprises with new ideas potentially crazy ideas, and a few of those will turn out sure. to be great ideas. Yeah. And they are competing amongst themselves. And this, uh, in my opinion, will unleash and is unleashing a whole plethora of new ideas that we can't necessarily see in advance. Right. And this is why Iceland needs to participate in international institutions mm -hmm. like the European Space Agency. It's in order for just Icelandic entrepreneurs and workers to be involved in that thing. And so when my fellow, or previously fellow politicians would ask me, so what do we gain from this? Honestly, I'm not sure. Right. But I know it's awesome. Right. At least to, <laughs> to give some context to that, um, there's one immediate problem that we are actually going to do a big campaign on in Iceland. As part of this, uh, this hackathon, it's not just happening in Iceland, it's happening in 10 other cities in Europe at the same time. And, but every country who's participating needs to come up with their own ch local challenges. And we actually were working with the Land and uh, you know, Forest Conservation ah, yeah. Organization of Iceland. And we basically pitched them the idea, saying that, hey, you know, we're doing this hackathon. Yeah, again, I'm no geologist, I'm, I'm not a scientist or anything like that. And I said, you know, it, it, it seems obvious that this land erosion is going to be a problem because yep. if the glaciers are melting, waters are going to flow out. Yes. And by the way, they're going to take the topsoil and you as an entity need to think about this. And they said, yes, yes, we're doing a lot of work. We're putting sensors all over Iceland. And I was like, really? 
uh, we should actually be taking the space data to look yeah, at this, yeah, right? Put them in the roof. And they were like, yes, yes, we absolutely want to do that. And I said, would you come and talk about this so you can inspire some of these hackers to build that stuff? And they were like, oh, we are on it. Yeah. We are so on it. Yeah. We want to be involved. Yeah. So I think that is, um, you know, the, the foundational technologies, this, the foundational way to think about these things were grounded in how we do something. Right? Like, yeah. for example, when you want to know what's going on on land, we think we'd put sensors. Yeah. Maybe we don't. Right? right. So, so the context of reducing the cost, actually doing it in a much more scalable way, and using data and technology to, to actually simulate what would happen yep. is probably a smarter. And by the way, those are all things that we can do now. You know, most of the PhD students do that in the university today. Right. Uh, so it is, it is basically bringing context to that. And I hope you know, uh, politicians and others see that you know, these are not going to pay immediate dividends, but these are the building blocks. Yes. And so uh, my role as a politician uh, previously is not necessarily explaining exactly you know, what kind of products are going to result from this. I could name a few things that are going on, for sure. But at the end of the day, the question is, are we participating in what gives us these opportunities? Mm -hmm what removes the isolation of this small nation. Right. And that isolation is international cooperation. Yeah. And, and I think um, not only that, uh, to all the aspiring students in the university, I think that this is another vector for them to dream about and say, you know what? I want to be in this yeah. field. Yeah. I want to build in this field. I want to participate in this field. I want to work for SpaceX. I and mean, you're not going to do it automatically. You need to have some skill set. We need to train those people to go and say, you know, if you want to work on SpaceX, you need to have these skills. Right. And they have to believe that they can. Yes. That's, that's fundamental. And, and it, you can't do that remote control. You have to have localized infrastructure to be able to do that. And I'm excited because the nice thing about space is that, uh, as you said, there's lots of small things mm -hmm. that founders and startups can build on. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, I think uh, startups from Iceland can do it. You know, why not? Why not? Why not? Um, I, think, I think, you know, this is, uh, this is a fun conversation and we can continue on forever. But uh, I think we're coming to the end of this uh, chat. Uh, Helgi, I want to thank you. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, last few words. What, 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 uh, what message you would like to leave us with? There's this old saying, whether you believe you can do it or you cannot, you're probably right. And we can do this. Um, small nations can do this. Uh, we are in a privileged position to go after these opportunities, and there is simply reason, no, no reason not to. Right. And, and with that, great, great words. Thanks again. And Thank you. Uh, looking forward to uh, crossing paths again with your new journey. Same to you. And to you all, this is the 10th episode. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll continue to bring interesting conversations. So if you need to learn more about the hackathon, you know where to find me. Thank you. <laughs>